Today, we continue the programmatic argument uh, addressed now to democracy, to the reorganization of democratic institutions. And before doing that, I want to remind you of the uh, general outline of the progressive alternative that I have been exploring and discussing with you here. Uh, there are four axes. The first is the democratization of the market economy. And it has three main elements. The first element is the reshaping of the relation between the backward and the advanced parts of production, focused on the deepening and dissemination of what is now the most advanced practice of production, the knowledge economy. The second element is the transformation of the relation of labor to capital. And the third element is the reconstruction of the relation of finance to production, to real economic activity. Uh, the second axis is the reorganization of civil society outside the state and outside the market. Uh, discussed earlier in the course in relation to the reinterpretation and redirection of nationalism. The third element is the reshaping of education, the formation of the capable individual, to which we will come next. And the fourth element is the deepening of democracy, the creation of a high energy democracy. Uh, I have not followed this order in which I've just reminded you of the general outline. Before the recess, we discussed the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy. Today, we discuss democracy and its transformation. And next week, education. With respect to the discussion of democracy, the deepening of democracy, the creation of a high energy democracy, my plan for today is the following. First, I want to place the debate about democracy in a historical context. A historical context about ideas, political ideas, <laughs> and a historical context about political institutions. Second, I present the general conception of a high energy democracy and the criteria by which we could ascertain its advance. Third, and this is then the heart of the discussion, I focus on the institutional innovations that would give content to the idea of a high energy democracy. And fourth, I discuss uh, the difficulties and the enigmas that beset this programmatic conception. So that's the plan. And as always, at each step of the way, I'll stop and invite your engagement. So first, the historical and especially the idea historical context of this discussion. Uh, one of the most famous political theoreticians of the modern period, uh, Benjamin Constant, uh, distinguished the ancient and the modern republic. So the ancient republic 
was supposedly the form of political life in which politics was central to existence. The protagonist of the ancient republic is the selfless, politically engaged citizen. And this idea of the ancient republic was formed on the largely mythical model of ancient Sparta, or the Roman Republic. By contrast, in Constant's contrast uh, distinction, the modern republic is the republic in which politics, political activity, becomes a peripheral engagement for the vast majority of men and women. A sideshow to the main concerns of existence, in which everyone except for the professional politicians engages only exceptionally. And the central protagonist, rather than being the selfless, fully engaged, absorbed citizen, is the flesh and blood, interest-bearing individual, concerned primarily with his private pursuits. A familiar trope in the history of modern political thought is the attack on established political ideas and institutions from the standpoint of this conception of the ancient republic, as if it were deeper and higher, and as if the modern republic represented a kind of falling away from a more demanding ideal. Uh, and this is the view that is carried forward in traditions such as the tradition of so-called civic or radical republicanism. Now, a major objection to this idea of the ancient republic is its bad utopianism. Uh, it refers to something that does not exist and never existed. Its conception of ancient Sparta or of Roman Republican life is a fantasy. And it has repeatedly been used in the history of modern political thought as a way simply to invert in imaginary fashion the realities of political life. So uh, it's a kind of pseudo-programmatic conception. It does not propose a path from here to there. It simply turns upside down our contemporary experience of politics. And therefore, the perspective that I take in this argument is decisively the perspective of what Benjamin Constant calls the modern republic, the republic in which politics is an ecstatic or exceptional activity, a deviation from the normal concerns of life for the vast majority of people. Not as a point of arrival, but as a point of departure because that is the point of departure that historical experience and political reality, in fact, give us. So here is, again, a way to understand what is at stake. in relation to a more abstract conception 
remember a distinction between two categories of activities, of moves that we can make in society. There are the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted. And then there are the, there are the exceptional moves by which from time to time, typically under the provocation of crisis, we challenge or change part of this framework. Now, what would it mean to deepen politics, starting from the point of departure of what Benjamin Constant calls the modern republic, which is the only real point of departure in our experience. The other thing, the ancient republic is just a fantasy. It would mean to diminish the distance between these two sets of moves so that the activity of challenging and changing pieces of the framework grows more naturally or continuously out of the ordinary business of life. And in this way, we diminish our dependence on crisis as the enabling condition of change. And we are able, to a higher degree, to become the masters of the structure within which we move. That would be a deepening of politics, and in particular, of democratic politics. If one of the things that democracy must mean is the subjection of the structure of society to collective self-determination. So in relation to this formative contrast in the history of political thought between the ancient and the modern republic, that is the perspective from which I am arguing, that the modern republic the republic in which the protagonist is the interest-bearing, interest-pursuing individual concerned with his private pursuits is inevitably the point of departure. And what we desire is not to replace it by a slate of hand, by an imaginary inversion, as in radical or civic republicanism, but to expand its reach so that the ability to perceive the structure, to engage with it, and to change it is gradually absorbed into the ordinary activity of life. And this idea is related to a fundamental theme that recurs in these arguments. The theme is that one of the basic dimensions of our freedom, of our self-possession, is that we be able to engage in the structures of social life without surrendering to them. Denying them the last word and keeping the last word for ourselves. Or to change the vocabulary, to arrange things in such a way that we can be insiders and outsiders at the same time. So that's what I wanted to say first by reference to this famous contrast in the history of political theory. 
Shall I go on, or would someone like to, to, to question and to engage on this point? Now, here's a second context. Now, not the context of the history of political theory, but rather the context of the history of political and especially constitutional institutions. The institutional organization of political life, and especially of democracy, has evolved on the basis of a very restricted repertory of live options. It's astonishing. The range of real constitutional alternatives in the world is extraordinarily narrow. If you didn't know what these institutions are, the constitutions of the contemporary societies, whether democratic or not, you would be unable to guess that they had this particular content. Although, of course, because we're used to them, we think of them as natural. And you could very broadly distinguish in the history of constitutional evolution uh, two concentric circles. An inner circle of what have been, in fact, the dominant or live constitutional options, and an outer circle. of the experiments or the fantasies of the opponents, of the would-be opponents, of the institutions established in the inner circle. Now let me first say a word about the outer circle, especially from the standpoint of the radicals or leftist critics of the dominant constitutional institutions. Their central idea has been the superiority of direct or participatory democracy over representative democracy. And in particular, they have repeatedly proposed or defended a particular form a specific form of political life, which has been the organization of politics on the basis of collectives or councils, the Soviets of the Russian Revolution, or the communes of 19th and 20th century European history. So the idea is there's a radical transformation. The radical transformation requires direct democracy as one of its central elements. And the basic institutional mechanism of direct democracy is democracy by councils of citizens or workers at the grassroots level. And no such experiment has ever lasted more than a few weeks or months. It has never worked in any society, in any country of significant size. So the attempt to establish this conciliar direct democracy has been evanescent. It's replaced either by conventional constitutional arrangements or by some kind of political despotism and authoritarian regime. 
established or not in the name of the people, of the, of the majority. So that's the outer circle. And the repeated failure of the experiments in the outer circle then seems to justify the restriction of the inner circle. So what has happened in the inner circle? It is the evolution of this very narrow range of constitutional options of modern democracies. European parliamentary or hybrid regimes and the American presidential system later copied in much of Latin America. These constitutional arrangements in the 19th century could be characterized as a proto-democratic liberalism. For example, take the American variant. Qualifications to the suffrage, educational and property qualifications. Many intermediate levels or layers of representation filtering out popular influence. And the ample use of counter-majoritarian restraints in the constitutional design. A major contest in the 19th century was over the expansion of the vote, of the suffrage. And a belief shared by both conservatives and leftists in the 19th century is that the expansion of the suffrage would have radical consequences because the propertyless majority would use the vote to overturn the established economic order. And of course, we know that that's not what happened. The suffrage was expanded. The counter-majoritarian restraints were diminished or loosened. But the resulting democracies were what we could call weak democracies that maintained political society at a relatively low level of popular engagement in political life and that tended to perpetuate impasse rather than to resolve it quickly. And the practical result? was to leave the established economic and social order relatively immune to political attack. So a clear, even in an extreme case, are the constitutional arrangements of the United States. Political life is organized to keep the level of popular political engagement low. And the constitutional design combines two principles. The liberal principle of the fragmentation of power and the conservative principle 
of the slowing down of politics through the Madisonian scheme of checks and balances. And these two principles, the liberal one and the conservative one, are supposed to be naturally and necessarily associated. But in fact, they're not associated naturally and necessarily. They're associated by design, intentionally, to safeguard the social order against political subversion. Now, if we look forward to the 20th century, and especially to the part of the world in which there have, has been relatively more constitutional innovation, Europe, we find uh, two novelties in the constitutional evolution. Both of them quite modest, confirming this extraordinary restriction of the live options in the institutional organization of political life. One characteristic of these 20th century constitutions, already manifest in the period between the two world wars, but then uh, deepened after the Second World War, is that the constitutions began to be filled up with promises of rights, of economic and social rights, the right to everything, to education, to housing, uh, to social welfare, to dignity, to happiness, tangible and intangible things. And this extravagant promise of social and economic rights was unaccompanied by any institutional machinery that could ensure that these promises would be kept. So they were like vain promises. That's one characteristic of the 20th century constitutions. The other characteristic is a rather narrow set of experiments in constitutional design, departing from a pure parliamentary regime. And you could call these experiments dualistic. So already between the two world wars, but then increasingly after the Second World War, in many countries, in many European countries especially, then imitated in other parts of the world, there were constitutional experiments with the combination of a directly elected president who would have a variable degree of power ranging from the ceremonial to the substantial and a government which would be responsible both to the president and to the parliament. So the sitting government would have two bases. One would be the president. The president might appoint the prime minister. But the other would be to the parliament and its majority. And the government then would have the flexibility to rely on either of these bases, the presidential support or the parliamentary support. 
And then there were a set of constitutional arrangements to resolve impasse. When there was a conflict between the president and the parliamentary majority. The president, for example, might be able to, dis to dismiss the parliament and call new elections. And the parliament to call down the government and call new elections itself. This is what I'm calling the dualistic system. For example, in the French version of this dualistic system, there are two variations. There are two political times. There's a fast time when the parliamentary majority and the president coincide, and there's a slow time, which the French call cohabitation, when the parliamentary majority is at odds with the president. So the basic ideas here were to subject the government, the executive power, to more than one source, more than one influence, more than one way of the people bringing their influence to bear. That's the dualism, the president and the parliament. To allow the government flexibility so they would not be accountable only to the president or only to the parliament, and to create mechanisms to resolve impasse when impasse arose in the system. Uh, so those are the two sets of major constitutional innovations in the 20th century. You can see that they're very modest. They did not represent any significant transformation of this low energy democracy that keeps the people at a low level of political engagement and inhibits politics from being a device for the transformation of the social and economic order. The tension between the extravagant promises of rights and the modesty or conservatism of the constitutional arrangements remained unresolved. You might think that all of those promises of rights would call for institutions, for constitutional institutions, arrangements, with great transformative potency. But that's not what happened. The promises of rights were unaccompanied by constitutional innovations, which would create the means to keep those promises through the transformation of the, of the economic and social order. And the result is what I'm calling a weak democracy. So what is a weak democracy? A weak democracy is a democracy in which the level of political mobilization in society, of popular political energy and engagement in political life is kept low. <coughs> Impasse tends to be perpetuated. And the vast preponderance of the social and economic order at any given time remains unchallenged. Not just unchanged, but unchallenged, except when there is a major crisis. And the major crisis in modern history 
comes in one of two forms, economic ruin, collapse, or military conflict, war. All the democracies that exist in the world are, by this criterion, weak democracies. Those are the only democracies that exist. And the attempt to replace weak democracy, defined in these terms, by direct or participatory democracy, the democracy of the councils, of the committees, has been a failure and a fantasy. So that is a deflationary summary of constitutional history. And uh, so we have this situation in the world that when a country wants to develop a, make a new constitution, it calls the constitutional lawyers the jurists, these typically legal academics who have 20,000 books in their library, and all they can come up with is to recombine the French constitution with the German constitution to do these little variations. It's as if they were working with the periodic table. Except that in their periodic table, there are only six elements, and therefore very few combinations. Now, isn't this fantastic? Uh, how could this have happened to the world? So, uh, but that's the situation that we have. Yes? You're saying that the uh, Yes. Why is that? Like, why do you think the relationship ignores that sort of uh, the fact that, like, the nature of politics is sort of uh, once in a while essential and sort of you need to be ready to. Uh, well, that would be a long argument. Why has it failed? I mean, the most obvious reason why it's failed is that large countries and complex societies just can't be organized that way by committees meeting on the street or ongoing workers' councils. They, they're unsuited to more than a moment of transient political enthusiasm. So that would be the, the starting claim, that, there, that, in, that there's no alternative to representative democracy. So what you could say, and this is an argument we'll come to, is that representative institutions can be enriched by cumulative elements of direct democracy. But adding a dimension of direct democracy to representative democracy is different from replacing representative democracy by direct democracy. That's what hasn't worked. And the, the, the most obvious reason why it hasn't worked is this is problem of scale, that the, these countries have to be organized. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is the one to which you referred, that the vast majority of people will continue to be the protagonists in Benjamin Constant's conception of the modern democracy. They won't be people who will be going to meetings all of the time. Well, I, so, I, I would sort of just push back a moment. Yes. You said before how we should be thinking about change. Yes. Yes. And it, it, what I see is a lot of experiments with political democracy happening here on the local level. Um, we see a lot of it, for example, of course. Like the internet discovery. Of course. Uh, and it seems to, if not be successful, to not be entirely a failure in any of these ways. So I agree. Yes, but that's different because that, I would say, is experiments of direct democracy and participation within some larger structure that has representative elements. So if you're organizing a whole country, the decisions of the different councils at the street level, at the community level, have to be organized. There has, there has to be a framework like, for example, there could be some ladder up 
in which they in turn elect representatives one level up, territorially or, or sectorally, and then you begin to have a constitutional design. But once you do that, you're already beginning to combine the direct with the representative. So what you're describing are these experiences of direct participation in some immediate context in which you're dealing face to face with the things that matter to you that you know something about in which you're directly engaged. Uh, and that certainly exists uh, and exists in many contexts, even in these weak democracies today, as fragments. But that's not how, that's not a solution to the problem of how political society in a large country can be organized. Then there has to be a constitutional architecture. And the, the, the representative elements of that architecture have to be combined somehow with the direct or participatory elements. That's a different kind of project. And so it's, it's, that project hasn't happened. So I, I'm not saying that couldn't happen or shouldn't happen. On the contrary. But uh, it's not what I meant by this outer circle. So the outer circle has not taken as its proposal that we should begin to transform representative democracy step by step. And that one of the ways in which we should begin to transform it is by enhancing it with elements of direct democracy. That would be, that would be a project with some prospect of success if there were a whole sequence of, of doing that. But that's not what I meant by the, the, the it has been the, 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 the posture of direct democracy in the revolutionary interludes has been to say, this is an elitist or bourgeois democracy. We'll sweep it aside in the moment of revolutionary incandescence, and we'll have only this uh, experience of direct mass engagement. And that's what's never worked. It couldn't work. And it's been only like a, a, a faint, which is soon pushed aside as the real people come to power. So there'd have to be a different kind of constitutional project. Now, there's still this, this, this mystery of why these constitutions have indulged in, this, in these long lists of promises of rights. Why have they done this? Uh, because it's, it's also not for real, unless there's some mechanism. So what, what do I mean by a mechanism? I mean two distinct things that are related. So one is that there be a set of economic and political institutions that over time and overall will, will work to keep those promises of rights. The second and more specific thing is that there will be a set of legal procedures that will allow the citizens to go to the judicial or administrative tribunals and to demand their, those rights that are promised. And so somehow those two things have to work together. And if they're not there, the promises are just promises, which is, for the most part, what has happened in these constitutions. Yes? Yes? Talk a little louder, sure. please. Yes. 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 
No, so 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 that's interesting. You might you might say that uh, if there's no divided government, there would be high mobil. There could be at least the potential for high mobilization. Um, but it's obviously not enough. And moreover, understand this in the constitutional architecture of what I call dualism. Dualism is not divided government in the sense of, uh, of a, a scheme like the Madisonian scheme of separation of power. Because under the dualistic system, there is fragmentation. There are many sources of power. There's the president with a strong mandate. There's the parliament directly elected, the government that can turn to either of them. So the fundamental issue is whether there is a constitutional machinery for resolving that impasse. And if there is a constitutional machinery for resolving the impasse, then this multiplication of sources of power could be even better than a unitary British parliamentary system. Because you would have different mechanisms for instigating political engagement, not just one, not just the election of the parliament, but you would combine that with a machinery to resolve the impasse. So take the example of the French system, in which, as I was saying, is the, the French constitutional reforms of 1958 and 1962. So they, they then produce a system that has two times, you should, could call it, a fast time and a slow time. So the fast time is when the president coincides with the parliamentary majority. The slow time is when the president diverges from the president, from the parliamentary majority. Now, you could easily, by a small variation in that system, you could abolish the slow time by saying, when that happens, when there is so-called cohabitation, uh, either the president or the parliament will be able to call anticipated elections to resolve the impasse. But uh, the, the election will always be bilateral for both political branches so that the branch that exercises the constitutional prerogative will have to pay the political price of running the electoral risk. So the parliament can dissolve itself and, and call elections, but the elections will also be for the president. The president can dissolve the parliament, but in dissolving the parliament, he himself has to run for election. So that's the system I'm imagining. And that's only like a modest variation on this dualistic system. And so when you, you speak about the contrast between divided and undivided government, the point is that's too crude a contrast. Because the fundamental issue is not the multiplication of powers, but it's the existence or non-existence of a series of constitutional arrangements to resolve impasse quickly when they arise. So, I think that the, 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 the two features of 20th century constitutional evolution that I emphasized, the promises of rights on the one hand and the constitutional dualism on the other, could both be seen as points of departure for the strengthening of democracy. Because you could say, well, we have these promises of rights, now let's arrange things so that we have a better chance of keeping the promises. So we'll have to innovate in the political and economic institutions, and we'll have to create legal procedures for the vindication of diffuse collective rights. 
and there'd be points of departure in each country, in the laws of each country. For example, in the United States, so-called complex enforcement, the structural injunctions, would be a point of departure. And each country would have legal procedures that would serve as a point of departure. So, and on the other side of the dualism, the dualism, by the introduction or the development of these mechanisms for the resolution of impasse, would also be a point of departure. So, I'm, so, so what I'm suggesting is that we don't start from nowhere. That is, the, these innovations of the 20th century have a certain potential if we think of them as a bridge to something else. So then the question is, what's the something else? So, so the spirit in which I'm describing this is not purely deflationary. It's not as if I'm saying this is worthless, saying this is obviously not enough. But if you look at it with other eyes, it has potential. And you could, you could begin to, to, to advance. But then you have to have this larger constitutional imagination, which has been deficient. And, uh, and so the, the, it seems to me that the allusion to, to pure direct or participatory democracy, or the radical Republican idea of the selfless citizen, will, which politics is the center of life, in a sense, these have all been diversions because they, they're, in, instead of taking on the task of going from here to there by some sequence of steps, they're like, they're like these imaginary inversions in which we don't really escape from the real world, transforming it step by step. We just turn it upside down in our imagination. And by decree, deny the, the real constraints on transformation. So it seems to me we, we, have, to, we have to confront all of this and, and begin to think transformatively. Yes? I'm wondering if it would be possible to imagine uh, kind of current interstitial status quo constitutions that uh, because of favorable you know, social and cultural factors nevertheless uh, enjoy as a strong I guess my question is, is trying to parse out how much the weak and wrong states of the present day are, are really a function of, of constitutional design, and how much is you know, cultural and social factors like the media environment, uh, you know, just like nation states of hundreds of millions of people and down to the middle class? Yeah. Well, so, so I, I, I think if I understand your motivation that I'm agreeing with you, that is that the, I'm not taking anything as just natural. And, I'm supposing that, that the things that we regard as cultural are, in fact, artifacts. They're constructions. So you take the United States, uh, which would be, in its dominant political culture, much of the time, an extreme example of Benjamin Constant's modern republic. Politics is an exceptional activity and so forth. But but give me the following. Give me, give, me, uh, give me in the United States a rule of mandatory voting, as exists in many democracies in the world. Now, understand what mandatory voting means. It just means that you have a requirement to vote. And if you don't vote, you pay a small fine. When you vote, you have the privilege of abstaining. So there's a civic burden, but it's actually much less onerous than the obligation for, to, uh, to submit a, uh, your income tax declaration, or much less onerous than military conscription, when there's military conscription. Uh, in the United States, only half of the, or half of the electorate votes. Under this system, everyone would vote, almost everyone. Uh, now then say, uh, the media companies, under the revocable licenses under, by which they operate, do their business, would have to reserve part of their time 
for free to the political parties and to the organized social movements. That also has begun to exist in many democracies in the world. Uh, and therefore, you couldn't buy television time, which all by itself would begin to change the relation between money and politics in the United States. The, the, the combined and cumulative effect of initiatives like that would transform the character of political experience in the United States. And then the things that are regarded as somehow natural or part of political culture, we would begin to reinterpret as the consequences of practical institutional arrangements. So uh, you're, you're obviously right that the situation of weak democracy is not just the effect of the constitutional arrangements. It's the effect of the constitutional arrangements with all the other arrangements. But the other arrangements are also structured. They're also the product of institutions. So uh, there's constitutional in the narrower sense, and there's constitutional in the broader sense. Yes? Yes. Yes. Well, I think you, in here, get, it gets us back to the discussion of direct democracy. So uh, I think the, 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 the situation is, is even more complicated than you just described for the following reason. You suggested that the people with interest in engagement, in going to meetings and talking about politics, are, for example, the people with wealth. They have material stakes, which they want to defend. Uh, it's not just them. Actually, they, for the most part, are also not interested in going to meetings about politics and send their representatives, hire their defenders. Uh, the people who really go to meetings are a small minority of talkers, rhetoricians, and manipulators who bore everyone else to death at these meetings. So whenever there's this experience of participation, like there'll be a community organization uh, monitoring some form of policy, we know what happens. This, the same little group shows up at all of the meetings, talk 90% of the time, Everyone else is bored and leave, and they control the show. So that, the, 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 this is the division of humanity into temperaments, into personalities, which is a blind spot in contemporary social thought. So that's an, wh another one of the reasons, apart from scale, why just direct democracy doesn't work. <laughs> 
So the strengthening of democracy can't mean that everyone is going to meetings all the time. It can't mean that. That won't work. That will produce this, this counter movement. Uh, it has to mean something else. So that, that's how I would respond to you. But, but the, uh, if you extended the argument in another direction, you could say people may also resent doing du jury duty or spending time preparing their tax declarations or whatever, but they do it nevertheless. And they, because it's part of the cost of maintaining these institutions. So it's, so it's absolutely true that we have to be selective in imposing these burdens of attention and not requiring that the strengthening of democracy take as its form this intense and pervasive engagement in political life, because that's unrealistic, as you're suggesting. But I don't think that it needs to. And that's the discussion that comes next about the institutional innovations. Yes. So a big part of how, I guess, elites control how energy flows is by dominating the one kind of business. Yes. Um, and so how, what, what kind of uh, frag, uh, you know, fragmentation would you propose to make to, uh, even if you're not preventing, if, even if you're not making Well, that's practical, right? So there we would reach the first set of innovations that I would describe as necessary to the creation of a high energy democracy, which are innovations that have to do with the temperature of politics, that is, the level of organized popular engagement in political life. And they will have to do with considerations such as the way in which the relation between money and politics is organized and the way in which the relation between politics and the media is organized. So these are practical arrangements, but with, with, with immense consequence, uh, responding precisely to this, to this concern. So, but the result of these arrangements is not this notion of permanent politics, in which for everyone, politics becomes the central concern because that is then this unrealistic diversion that becomes counterproductive. So I, I, I want to come to that next. Yes? Would you also argue that one of the limitations on direct democracy and seizing democracy in general is that we're not adequately equipping citizens through education? I think we'll talk about this yes. Yes. Just the limitation of the way that our education system is set up now, not only do people not have the time, but they don't have their own personal knowledge, skills, that is adequate in the state. Of course. But so there's the issue of basic, of the underlying educational system and the habits and powers of mind that it equips people with. But there's also political education. This is one of the essential phases of democracy. How do, you, how do you learn to think politically? By doing politics. There, there's, there's no other way. So you could, you could have an exquisite general education, but still be politically primitive if you have no experience of political engagement. So we think that the it's like, you know, take, 
take the issue of television, which is a very interesting in its effect on modern politics. So if television time is very brief, it can become an instrument of subterfuge. So a person presents himself in, uh, in a manipulated form. But if there's a lot of television time, it's the opposite. And it's very difficult to disguise yourself because television is a, is a surprisingly intimate medium which reveals who the person is. Uh, and so then you would say the antidote to the political dangers of television is more television. That's, that's the solution. And the, same, and the same goes for political life generally. That, that, uh, that's, that's what we have reason to believe. That's what I think. Uh, and that it's, it's not by this extreme filtering or constraint that we solve these problems, but by the opposite. And of course, that is the experience of this local democracy and its superiority because it, it undermines, it weakens this possibility of, of, of pretense, of political hypocrisy. It reveals people for who they are, for what they really want. And so the question is how we can organize the representative institutions at the national level so they have more of that quality. So then that, that brings me to, this, to the next stage, which is then what is, the, what is the conception of a high energy democracy? If all the democracies that exist in the world are weak democracies, what is a high energy democracy? So the conception of a high energy democracy is it's a democracy. First, it is a democracy that can master the structure of society. So what are these structures? What's the nature of the structures of society? The structures of society are us. So can think of it as a kind of frozen fighting. What is history? History is this, is this contest, practical and visionary contest, over the terms of our access to one another. This contest is periodically contained or interrupted. And the structures are then the residue when the fighting is contained or interrupted. So, or think of it as a game of musical chairs. So the music stops and we sit down and the chairs are the structures. So the structures aren't natural phenomena, the structures are us. But the structures may be organized so that to a greater or, le or lesser extent, they entrench themselves against challenge and change and present themselves to us as if they were natural phenomena, part of the furniture of the universe. Or on the contrary, they can be organized so that they offer themselves to us as objects of challenge and change. And that's superior. Because then we can engage in them without surrendering to them then we can experiment with them as we go along. And that's what we want. So one thing that a high energy democracy must mean and be is that it must have as its expression, as its consequence, this transformation of our relation to the structures of social life. Allowing us to take them not as an alien fate, but as simply the frozen part of our own past activity and to challenge and change them as we go along. 
And therefore, a high energy democracy must also diminish the distance between the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of assumptions and arrangements that we take for granted and the extraordinary moves by which we challenge and change pieces of the framework. So the transformation of the framework must grow more continuously and naturally out of the ordinary business of life. Then a high energy democracy must be a democracy in which the dependence of change on crisis diminishes. So in a, in a weak democracy, change is impossible, except when there's crisis. And crisis in the two master forms of economic ruin or military conflict, war. So one criterion by which to measure the advance to a strong democracy, a high energy democracy, is that the dependence of transformation on trauma diminishes. So that the impulse to transformation becomes endogenous, internal to social and political life, and not dependent on some external shock in the form of economic collapse or military conflict. And therefore, continuing this conception of high energy democracy, the living are not ruled by the dead. The living rule themselves. Because the consequence of weak democracy, of the naturalization of the structure, is the rule of the living by the dead. So the fundamental idea at stake in this conception of, of high energy democracy is, is an idea of freedom, of empowerment, that we are the masters of the structures, that there's more in us than there is in them, they, we, we contain more than they could ever contain. They are finite in relation to us. We are infinite in relation to them. We transcend. It's an idea of transcendence. And, trans, and this power of transcendence, this empowerment, manifests itself in the ability to create the new. So that then becomes another definition of democracy. Democracy is not just the rule of the majority qualified by the rights of the minorities. Democracy is the collective creation of the new, in which we are not reduced to being the puppets of some structure that we inherited, but we can create our own world. That's democracy on this view of what a high energy democracy is. So that, there's the conception. So, shall I go on to its institutional content? So the, first, the, so the first set of institutional innovations that would give it content has to do with the temperature of politics. So what I mean by the temperature of politics is the level of organized popular engagement in political life. So it's what political science calls political mobilization. That's the temperature of politics. So a high temperature politics is a politics with a high level of political mobilization. Now, in conservative statecraft and conservative political science, there is the idea of a basic opposition. And the opposition is this. Politics must either be institutional and cold, meaning a low level of political mobilization, or it must be hot and anti or extra institutional. As in Caesarism, so the strong man, the leader, who acts against the institutions, 
So in the conservative statecraft and political science, a fundamental image is this contrast between, let's say, Madison and Mussolini. So those are the fundamental options in political life. It's cold and institutional, or it's hot and anti-institutional. Now, what is excluded by this idea, which is at the center of the conservative political imagination, is the conception of a form of political experience that is institutional and hot at the same time. That's the possibility that is denied. And the empirical claim justifying the rejection of that opposition is the idea that political institutions, including the political institutions that have already existed in history, differ in the extent to which they sustain a heightening of the level of organized political mobilization. So they already differ in that respect. It's not just that we're conjecturing a possible variation. They already vary along that dimension. And the limited variation that already exists in history then encourages us to imagine a wider range of possible variation. So then the, the question becomes, what are the particular arrangements that hold the promise of heightening the level of organized popular engagement? Hot and institutional. And they're not one set of arrangements, but they're a combined set of arrangements. So first, there are electoral regimes. So for example, Proportional representation, in some contexts, could heighten the level of organized political engagement. But in others, it could be the opposite. So it's all circumstantial. So for example, in a country in which there's a highly fragmented party system, Uh, like Italy today. Proportional representation can have the opposite effect. And the adoption of a first-past-the-post system of voting could help reveal un uh, underlying opposition between progressive and conservative forces. So there's no general significance of the electoral regimes. It depends on circumstance. But that doesn't mean that they're unimportant. They're very important. But their significance has to be judged in context. Then second, there are the rules about the relation between money and politics. So the public financing of political activity all by itself radically diminishes the influence of private money, whether or not the use of private money is constrained. And third, there are the rules governing the access to the means of mass communication, as in the example I just gave, that you have a, uh, a system of free, guaranteed access to the means of mass communication as a condition of their doing their business. And not just for the political parties, but we can imagine for the organized social movements. And fourth, there is the question of the mandatory or optional character of voting. And we could go on with the list. But the point is that the, that the combined effect of these initiatives changes the character of political culture and organizes a, a form of engagement that is both institutional and hot. So that's the first set of innovations. So shall I go on to the second set of innovations? <laughs> 
So the second set of innovations is about the pace of politics. The first is about the temperature. The second is about the pace. So what do we want in a high energy democracy? We want to be able to say of politics what the philosopher of science, Karl Popper, said about science, that the point in science is to make mistakes as quickly as possible. So that's what we want in politics. We don't want impasse to be perpetuated. We want it to be resolved quickly. So there should be many sources of power, of initiative in the state. And the multiplication of sources of initiative will naturally give rise to impasse. And what we want are constitutional mechanisms that resolve impasse quickly. And resolve impasse quickly through the engagement of the general electorate in the resolution of the impasse. So in the dualistic continental European systems or in the American presidential regime, we would say if there is an impasse, there are two classes of solution. One is the, the, the category of solution that I described. Each political branch of government enjoys unilaterally the power to break the impasse by calling early elections. But the exercise of the power must always be bilateral. So whoever exercises the power pays the political price of running the electoral risk. And the other category of practical solutions is the recourse to comprehensive programmatic plebiscites or referenda. So they're not single issue plebiscites, uh, referenda as exist in the American states. Uh, they're comprehensive. There are, two, there are two directions. We'll vote on those directions to resolve the impasse. And then there's a national debate. So there is some problem, like the problem that you raised there about political attention. But it's not as if these were ongoing meetings. These, were, these are, were then points of inflection in which the, there's, a, there's a stalemate, there's a blockage, and the idea is the blockage has to be resolved quickly. So if you relate this to my comment about the American constitutional design, I said there are two principles in the American constitutional arrangements. There's a liberal principle, and there's the conservative principle. The conservative principle is slowing down politics. The liberal principle is fragmenting power. And what you would say is, we'll reaffirm the liberal principle, but we'll get rid of the conservative one. And get rid of the conservative one will not mean abolishing the separation of powers. It will mean creating a series of constitutional mechanisms for the resolution of impasse when impasse arises. Because the problem is not the separation of powers. The problem is what happens when the separation of powers generates a stalemate. So by the simple device of introducing this mechanism for the rapid resolution of impasse, we turn the constitutional arrangement on its head and make it a machine for the acceleration of politics. Now then, a third set of innovations has to do with the relation between the center and the periphery in a state. By the relation between the center and the periphery, I mean the relation between the central government and provincial or municipal governments, local governments, either in a federal state or in a unitary state. So the conventional conservative view is uh, 
that there's a hydraulic inverse relation between power to the center and power to the periphery. So this is the conventional approach to federalism. Either the central government has more power or the states have more power. And what is what 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 one wins, the other loses. But this is false. Because we can imagine constitutional arrangements under which the central government has a possibility of decisive initiative. But the periphery, the local governments, can diverge from this strong central path. So that's the experimentalist potential of a federal system. Now, the same thing can happen in a unitary state. Under a, in a unitary state, like the United Kingdom or France, the central government can have strong powers of central initiative combined with the possibility of radical devolution of power to parts of the country. So if you take just the example of, of federalism, which is in some ways clearer, easier to think about, you can imagine two stages. In one stage, the emphasis is on cooperative federalism. So cooperation in a federal system can be vertical or horizontal. Vertical is collaboration among the three levels of the federation to do something new. For example, an educational policy or an industrial policy. And cooperative is uh, horizontal federal cooperation is cooperation among units of the federation at the same level, among municipalities or among states. For example, the states in a certain region of the country to develop a regional development strategy. That's the first stage of experimentalism. The second stage of experimentalism is to allow parts of the country to secede from the dominant national solutions and develop counter models of the national future. So it's as if you say, society goes down a certain path. But in going down a certain path, it hedges its bets and allows parts of itself to, to, to diverge and to do something different. So that this something different then will be a tangible model, not just a set of abstractions, exemplifying a different version of the national path. So the problem, one of the problems in the political life of weak democracies is that they, their political life has the character of, of be, being a sequence of everyone's second best solutions. So each political party says, my proposal was never adequately tried. It was tried only in some compromised form. And then it's as if the dominant solutions were just some kind of lowest common denominator. So what we would want instead would be for a decisive initiative at the central level in the central government but not crowding out divergences so that part of the country secedes. Now, the secession has to be limited so that it not be used in order to entrench the prerogatives, the privileges of some part of the population against the other parts. So there would have to be two kinds of checks. There would have to be political check by the, the political branches of government. They would have to approve it. Some wide divergence from the general solutions. And there'd have to be a judicial check. There'd have to be a series of legal standards guaranteeing that the privilege of divergence or secession was not used to entrench some sectarian set of prerogatives. 
And for this possibility of secession to be radical in its outcome, it couldn't be uniform. So understand what I mean. I'll take the example of a federation. If all the states in a federation enjoy the same degree of experimental divergence, none of them can go very far in diverging. So in, so in addition to the standard degree of divergence, the states would have to be able to apply for what you could call wide divergence under political and judicial check. And what do we want? We want, we want to tap the experimentalist potential of a federal system. That's what it's for. It's, it exists to experiment. Uh, so how do we discover the national path? We discover by trying it out in different variations. Now, just take those first three sets of innovations I've just outlined. The heightening of the temperature of politics, the hastening of the pace of politics, and the combination of strong central initiative with experimental divergence within the country. Uh, it seems that the American progressives believe that the place to begin is the second set of innovations. The ones that have to do, and especially the relation of money to politics. I'm sorry, the first set of innovations. The temperature of politics, and especially with respect to the relation of money to politics. That doesn't seem to be, in the American context, the best place to begin. The best place to begin is the energizing of American federalism. Because that is the cause that in the United States seems to have the widest appeal across the broadest part of the political spectrum. It's not just a left issue. It's an issue that is, appeals to the American experimental impulse and the cause of federalism is widely appreciated in the United States. So in the United States, it seems that the most plausible sequence for innovation would be first, the innovations tapping the potential of the federal system. Second, the innovations having to do with the temperature of politics the relation between money and politics and media and politics, and only last, the constitutional arrangements having to do with the pace of politics because of the cult of the Constitution in the United States. So it's a sacrosanct part of the American political identity. So it'd be the last place you would reach. Now, I haven't finished with my list of innovations giving content to the idea of a high energy democracy. But let me stop there before I go on to two other sets of innovation. Yes? I, I agree with the idea of expanding federalism, but my biggest concern with it is the question of who's deciding when a state's decision to opt out of a policy or pursue their own path is, uh, is injuring some subgroups rights or protecting some discrete minority, like, doesn't that present a, just a major issue of it becoming very partisan of whoever's in charge in, at the time deciding that? So what I'm imagining is a twofold check. So there are two filters. One is a political filter. It has to be approved by the Congress and by the executive according to the distribution of power in the Constitution, a veto and and and, and so forth. That's the political check. Then there have to be a judicial check. So the jurists and the judges would have to develop a, a law, a series of standards. As they've developed with respect to equal protection or due process, so it would be analogous procedure. Uh, so it couldn't, be, it couldn't be a black box. They, they'd have to develop a series of differential standards 
that would test the issue of discriminatory impact. And that's what they've done in other branches of law. So I don't see why they couldn't do it with respect to this. It's an entirely equivalent task. Uh, and, and not at all impossible. I think the, the, the most radical innovation there in that chapter is the relaxing of the criterion of uniformity. Because, of course, in, a, uh, in conventional federalism, we imagine that all the states of the union enjoy the same degree of divergence. And if they enjoy the same degree of divergence, always at the same time, the level of divergence must necessarily be very limited. So that's why I'm imagining that in addition to this uniform prerogative of divergence, there would be an extra divergence for which the states could apply. They want to do something different. They want to have a different kind of industrial policy, for example, requiring some more far-reaching form of economic reorganization. And uh, that might be in tension with the laws and the Constitution in some way. And then they would apply for this, for this divergence. And the divergence would be subject to these two filters. So it's something very simple. That it's, that, that it's, in, it's, it's in the interest of the country to experiment. And, and it, it, it defines its path by trying it out. And so federalism has this epistemological significance. It's, it's a device of discovery of what works, what doesn't work, what has different consequences. And it is in the interest of the whole society, as I said, to hedge its bets. So it goes down a certain road, but it says we won't put all our chips in that basket. We'll allow parts of the country to experiment with another way. And that's, it seems that in a conception that associates democracy with experimentalism, that's what we should want. And that also would be the meaning of radical devolution in a unitary state. So it doesn't have to be a federation to do that. That's the idea. Yes. Well, but in reality, in the political class, it's not true, is it, empirically, that the political class in the United States, for example, is united on the idea of the maximum power to the central government. This is a famous axis of division in American history, in which m many of the political forces have wanted to increase the rights of the states. I agree. And that Yes. Even those individuals who preach state rights when it comes to giving away their own power at the federal level to preserve that right. Well, but it depends on what the political forces are. That is, if, if it, it's a concrete subject of do, do the political forces that are in control of the Congress want to promote some kind of experiment in parts of the country? that they don't have enough power to implement uniformly at the national level. And so they might well have an interest in that. And uh, they have had such an interest in uh, less clear forms in many earlier moments in American history. So I don't see why they wouldn't have an interest in that. And. Uh, it's not as if the political class had 
the posture and self-conception of being simply like a, a, a federal bureaucracy. They, they associate power with where they came from, with the states, with what goes on in their states, and with what they can do there. And then in the hope that what they do there can then be an example for the country and a power base, a base to take more power in the country. That seems to me entirely realistic. I don't see anything contradictory in that. Uh, there are certain countries like France in which the political class has had a very centralist perspective, but that centralist perspective is also on a, under attack, even there. So it doesn't seem to me at all impossible. I think the, ma the, main, the main conception is that this isn't a system, right, these, these innovations. It's not like this is all a kind of take it or leave it thing. This, this is a combination of initiatives that in their cumulative effect deepen democracy, go in the, in the direction of a high energy democracy. And you begin wherever you can. So the idea is you, you, you I, I made a, an empirical claim about what seems the most promising point of departure in the United States, the energizing of federalism. But in another country, it might be a different one. And so you, you begin where you can, and then you advance in that front until you hit against the limits imposed by other fronts. And that begins to change the whole character of political life. Now, let me just mention briefly two other two other sets of innovations uh, that are also move in the direction of high energy democracy. So a fourth set of innovations has to do with this problem that exists in these societies. The, the societies governed by weak democracies continue to be class societies. And in those class societies, there are groups that find themselves caught in a circumstance of exclusion or disadvantage from which they are unable to escape by the forms of collective economic and political action that are available to them. So then you could imagine that there would be some power in the state, some branch of government, that would be equipped, legitimated, and designed to go to the rescue of these groups and reshape part of the background of social life in some area of the, of the society. So it would be a form of intervention that is structural. It has to do with the normative background, with the rules, with the arrangements and the practices in some part of social life. But it's not universal, it's localized. So it's both structural and localized. So because it's localized, it's not appropriate for the legislature. And because it's structural, it's not appropriate for the executive. So in the... It, it, Structural also, it's, it's, it's not appropriate for the executive and it's not appropriate in principle for the judiciary. So the tripartite state is not organized to deal with this. Now look at what's happened in the United States. So the, the judiciary, the federal judiciary, in the historical period in which the progressives had political ascendancy, developed a series of procedural mechanisms to deal with this problem. And those were the structural injunctions or complex enforcement. But in, with respect to relatively peripheral institutions, like prisons or mental asylums or school systems, not the central institutions of production and power, 
So there was no branch of the state appropriate to do this work. So the judges did it because they wanted to do it until they ran out of power. So you could imagine then that we would create a branch of government designed for this purpose. The judiciary is not designed for this purpose. Uh, and with the resources of staff and money and power necessary to do this work of a form of reconstructive intervention that is localized for the specific purpose of coming to the aid of these groups that are secluded in some corner of social life, in some circumstance of disadvantage, from which they are unable to escape. And that would be another form. So we would institute a power in the state, a branch of government, for that purpose. Recognizing the contradiction between democracy and class society. And now a fifth set of innovations, going back to our discussion of participatory or direct democracy. We would begin to enrich representative democracy with elements of direct or participatory democracy. So we can't replace representative institutions with direct democracy. That's an illusion that, that then turns on against itself. But we can enhance representative institutions with elements of direct democracy. And we can do that in, in two ways, from the bottom up or from the top down. From the bottom up, we can do it by increased popular engagement in local government. For example, participatory budgeting or neighborhood associations that share power with local government. And we can do it top down by comprehensive programmatic plebiscites and referenda, which invite the people to intervene directly in these moments of national inflection in a national programmatic debate. And we can extend the list. So I've given five sets of institutional innovations. The point is that we then, little by little, begin to translate the abstract conception of a high energy democracy into a, a tangible form of political life. And it's not a system, it's a direction. Now, Aside from all of the practical problems that we have begun to discuss, and the famous question of the disposition of people to engage in political life and political debate, there's another question, which is the background spiritual question, which is all of this, this idea of high energy democracy, presupposes a higher conception of the human being as the master of the structure. It's an idea of empowerment or of transcendence. And there is a problem. The problem is that in much of the world, including the richest parts of the world, or especially the richest parts of the world, people have come to think that littleness is natural. And that's the spiritual background to weak democracy. So what are we going to do about that? So we've run out of time. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but this, is, this, is a, this is a theme that I want to uh, keep at the center of the remainder of the course. And so I want to begin the next class still with some, still with more discussion of democracy, but then go on to education. And a bridge between the discussion of democracy and the discussion of education
is the theme of littleness, littleness and greatness. We'll continue next week.